Welcome to the Tragedy Academy, a show created to bridge societal divides in a judgment-free zone using candor and humor. My name is Jay, and I am joined today by Daniel Megler, experienced mental health professional advocate for emotional support animals in a mental health in mental health treatment. Um, I've seen a lot of transformational impact on of ESAs and an active member of mental health professional communities. How are you doing today, Daniel? I'm doing fantastic. Very excited to be here. Dude, I'm super excited to have you on. Um, I was listening to a whole bunch of your episodes, and you have by far one of the most soothing voices. <laughs> does it does it come with a beard? <laughs> I think, you know, it, the, the voice stays the same. The beard comes and goes, depending on how long my wife can tolerate it. But uh, so I guess the, the voice is not directly linked to okay. the beard. You know, I always check. Sure. I've got... Yeah, it's 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 always in there emotionally. The beard. I think my face is meant to have a beard. It just uh, sometimes I get to keep it, and sometimes I don't. Well, it's obviously meant to have a beard. We're the ones <laughs> taking it away. That said, I had a really interesting uh, guest on. He was a yogi, and uh, Amrit Singh, and he described the beard as the female portion of the psyche and that it was like the lower mm. half and that the beard gave you that feminine strength and that it mm. allowed you to be more compassionate understanding I was it was kind of like for me it was like putting a tail on a kite because as a man oh, I'm everywhere <laughs> Why do you think for men, sometimes our facial hair is an opportunity for self-expression? I was talking to one of my clients who, uh, her boyfriend was really insecure about her wearing makeup when she was going out because he's like, well, you already have someone. Why do you need that? You know, why are you, I, I'm not going to be going out with you. So why are you putting makeup on? And her response was just that When's his her makeup session? was, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Her, her makeup was just part of her, this is her canvas, her art, her identity, and her ability to put that on and show who she is. And for some of us as men, you know, when we have facial hair, it's one of the only times we get to show a little bit of expression of our identity and who we are in, you know, because we're not as big on hair dye or makeup or things like that. So fashion, fa facial fashion, I guess, are, it may be a way of tapping into our, our feminine side or our more expressive side. <laughs> you know, I, I think you're right. It also gets rid of that second chin, which is freaking amazing on top <laughs> On top of that, I think that you can hold two completely different personalities in a beard and people don't know mm -hmm. which one you're going to be if you don't say anything. You can either be terrifying <laughs> or you can be yeah. cuddly. Like there's no in between yeah. with a beard. <laughs> so you can just stand there and let them decipher it. That's funny. So welcome to the show, Daniel. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit how you got into the mental health profession and uh, what you're doing now and kind of go from there. Well, I went through a period, during, you know, like many people in their child and youth, uh, middle school was particularly rough, got bullied, things like mm -hmm. that, and went through a period of depression. And I had some adults um, in youth groups that I was in who really made me feel cared for and important. And they set me on a better path of service to others. And I thought I wanted to go into politics, but then as I got into college and whatnot, I volunteered in a couple campaigns and I was like, this is really gross. This is just <laughs> disgusting. Like, just a little gross. Yeah. I, I mean, no, you know, go, go ahead. ahead, please. I was just saying, no one really seemed to care about helping people. They just cared about who sat next to who and how many fundraising dollars were there. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll do some work with nonprofits. And I volunteered for a place called the Illinois Council Against Handgun Violence. And then as a senior in college, I needed to get a job as I was graduating. And so I called up a list of organizations that they had worked with. And one was called the Center for Violence Interruption. And I thought, well, that sounds like a good thing. And so I got offered a job there as a schools trainer. And so I worked with kids who'd been kicked out of regular Chicago public schools and uh, teaching them about male socialization theory and things. And I was like, this is it. This direct service with kids. I'm, I'm loving this. But I didn't love making nineteen thousand dollars a year. So <laughs> some people likes said nineteen k a year, <laughs> and, unless you like a tiny home and him clothing. Right. If I was able to go off the grid, so so people said to me, "All right, well then you got to go to grad school and you got to get you know so what what should I measure?" And then they said master's in social work. And so in doing that, um, I really realized that that was the connection for me. Mm. And in the process, school social work became the perfect environment because you get to work with kids 
for free. You don't have to charge anyone. And I don't love, I do private practice. Mm. I've been doing it for, you know, 15 years. But one of the things I love about working in a school is I can see whoever comes to me. And I can have a session that's 15 minutes if that's what they need. And I can have a session that's an hour and a half if that's what they need. And I can be more dynamic. When a person comes to me in my private practice and they talk about their girlfriend or their boss or whatnot, I don't really know anything but what they tell me. But when a kid is in my office, I know their friends. I know who their math teacher is. So it's this awesome dynamic environment. So I've worked in hospitals and I've worked in group homes and I've worked in lots of different environments. But I love my, my current day job of being a school social worker, then doing the private practice on the side, and then my work uh, with Foster Patrick as uh, in any free time that, my, that doesn't go to my wife and kids is where I'm at. I also, unfortunately, have a lot of um, personal family experience with mental health. My family growing up was kind of like the DSM being acted out live on <laughs> <Okay>. stage. So, <laughs> so, I, yeah, so I, my family... My, my family's got like a whole bag of ICD-10 codes that you could just shake <laughs> on the table like... Like you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or something. <laughs> Each one's got a different yeah. one. Yeah, hundred percent. So that's for me, you know, mental health conversations. When, you know, Aunt Lorraine is having paranoid schizophrenic thoughts and seeing tigers that are in the disposal when they're not really there from the time you're eight, you know, like that's wrong that's place the norm. to be trying to grab a tiger. Right. Well, and that's as long as you don't stick your hand down there, the tiger's not going to get you. So it's safe either way. But uh, the, the point is that in my family, it wasn't, it wasn't odd, unfortunately, to be talking about mental health things because it was deeply impactful for, for many people in my home. That's an amazing foundation to start from. And I want to kind of uh, take a step back because you did describe, you know, quite a resume of amazing opportunities that you had mm -hmm. to impact people's lives. And I use that word opportunity for a reason. Because when someone describes a situation where they're in the mental health community and they're servicing those that they're working with and they're not making a ton of money and they're seeing patients basically in the environment, like you said, almost like I grew up in Medicaid and free clinics, right? It's kind of a scenario like that, but without the sadness wrapped around it, <laughs> the line mm -hmm. outside. But mm -hmm. To visualize it as an opportunity to have impact without any financial repercussions is something that I don't believe everybody shares. And I feel mm -hmm. like perspective is a huge way to living life. And the lenses that you wear when you're viewing opportunities, because everything that we do is an opportunity. We just, it's all about phrasing and how we mm -hmm. approach it. And the fact that you didn't choose the things like I have to see these kids that have horrible home lives or nobody's parenting them and then they come in here and they scream. There's so many ways to describe this scenario from the opposite side, but you described it as an opportunity. And I wanted to highlight that because I find it's very special um, and that more people could benefit from looking at things through lenses um, and having that ability to decipher what is an opportunity versus you know, some kind of mire, <laughs> the daily mire. And it's, it's really that have to versus get to mindset. And I do remember, you know, my mother used to, both of her older sisters, she would have to go to the nursing home and visit them. No one else was there. Neither of them had children. And she would say, oh, I have to go visit Lorraine. And I have to go visit Eileen. And I said to her, you get to, because there's going to be a day when they both died mm. and you're going to miss that opportunity. And I remember my mom, you know, laughing about it. We were being sarcastic at times. But then, you know, on the day of my Aunt Lorraine's funeral, her saying, get to, you know, she realized that for that last 10 years, that was an opportunity. And so it, you're right. In everything in our life, it's a have to versus get to. Um, Irvin Yalom, who's the greatest therapist of all time, he writes textbooks, but he also writes um, novels. And in his novel, When Nietzsche Wept, the main protagonist is uh, Dr. Joseph Brewer, who um, is in real life, he was Freud's mentor. But in the, the historical fiction novel, he's doing therapy I for Nietzsche. I want to meet this dude. Hold on a minute. Yeah. How do you, who mentors and shakes out a Freud? Like, I right? need to yeah. see the character at the beginning of this. Where's the prequel? <laughs> right, exactly. What? And, and that's in and the, and this story, in this historical fiction story, this the idea that he he gives up his all of his medical practice, his his life, his training, and he flees from his family in Vienna and goes to Italy and is drinking this espresso on a palazzo, and he's totally free of all the obligations. And he says, "Oh my God, what have I done?" And fortunately for him, he hadn't actually done it. He had just had Freud hypnotize him into thinking he'd done it for a day. 
And then he comes back to his own life and he realizes, I choose my life. All of my obligations, everything I have to do, I now choose these things. And that's how, again, to your point, every problem is an opportunity. And so I'm, I'm looking at, unfortunately, and this is your, the title of your podcast, The Tragedy Academy. I, um, I'm marked by tragedies. Of, like literally, I have these tattoos on my, my arms of, of people I've lost to suicide. And uh, those tragedies have formed and shaped me and they continue to and they always will. And it's about that opportunity to take that and do something good with it. Right. Um, I like to use the metaphor of you have to hit your knees to plant the seed to grow your new tree of life. And in order to do, like, like we're discussing, there has to be that moment in life and not necessarily one that will change the complete course of your life, but one that can alter your perspective. Because for some people, um, one of our guests brought up a great term or a, a great way to describe addiction. They said addiction was an invitation for ascension. And I was like, you know, that's mm. a brilliant way to view that. Because too often, we want to view that from a detrimental end of life, everything is over scenario. But what we should be looking at is that nothing's going to ever be that bad again. And mm -hmm. you get to choose your own adventure going forward, like the old books. It really mm -hmm. is that. We're describing a mask, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's all different viewpoints of this three-dimensional ego. And we're running circles around it, but it's a mask. And mm -hmm. having that ability to discern um, the impact that people's lives are having on them, i.e. suicidal ideations, that type of thing, it takes a very special gift. And I think that that was something that was honed through your childhood. And I, I can appreciate that. And I think the identification of these crucial moments, the tragedies on your arms, um, speak volumes for why you have the passion that you have. Um, I'm no stranger to suicidal ideations and uh, the impact of suicide within, you know, family and friendships. Um, I lost a friend uh, about four or five years ago, and it was a catalyst to uh, one of the many to start the show. Um, it's, it, it is something that requires, again, that lens. Am I going to view this through a victim lens and remain in it? Or am I going to view it from triumph or the ability mm -hmm. to learn and move forward and capitalize on the pain? Pain is art. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, you know, it tells us something. I think all of our you know, emotions and all of our physical senses tell us about our environment. And if pain is there, it's telling us that, you know, there's, there's this information. And now what do I want to do with that information? Pain is a signal telling us to move, to make change, that what we're currently doing needs to be altered. <laughs> and so how can, I, how can I take that pain and use it and make change? And that's, you know, in May, so in May of 2020, um, one of my students, uh, Patrick Romer, died by suicide. And um, his, the, the community started to go fund me to help support the family. And the family said, we don't really need this money. We want to take this to do something that would support, you know, his legacy and what he loved. And Patrick loved more than anything else, animals. And he loved his dog, Cece, in particular. Unfortunately, the first day of his senior year of high school, which, you know, was, was the previous fall, Cece died. She was only six years old. And that bond, that was the thing that had kept him going through many hard days and hard, you know, travails. I remember he, during his junior year, working with him and he would come down to my office and some very frequently when he was stressed and anxious, he couldn't speak. And he would just, I would ask questions, he would just nod. And all he really wanted was to be able to get out of the building and go home and be with Cece. And so the Romer family started Pauser Patrick to try to connect young people with mental health issues to emotional support animals. Because, you know, the best therapists in the world, they can't be there for you at three in the morning, but your dog, your cat, your fish, whatever it is that like brings you joy and connection, that can be there. And so that's why I like taking that tragedy, taking that negative experience and being able to do something with it. I know it's been extremely healing for the Rummer family. And for me, there's, there is, I think, no greater feeling of failure you can have as a therapist than when you get that call that someone that you're working with 
has made a suicide attempt and unfortunately died by suicide. Mm -hmm. And I've unfortunately had that a couple of times in my career. Because when people trust you to help their child, when they trust you to help them, that's this, this feeling like you have let them down in no greater way. But then if I take responsibility for their death, then that would mean I would also have to take credit for everyone's success. So I have to remember that I'm only a part of people's story. I'm not the entire story. A lot of self-awareness because that's a difficult tightrope to walk. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting you here, but oh, I'd no, be remiss to not bring up the fact that you're highlighting something very important for the mental health professional community. Um, too often we forget that there is a recipient to what we're putting out there in these sessions. And it doesn't mm -hmm. fall on deaf ears. It's not linoleum or tile or whatever it is. It sticks and it hurts. And mm -hmm. there, it takes an empathetic person to be in that role. But there is an opposing side to being empathetic. And that is how do you cope with helping those people with those deep wounds without taking them on in some way yourself. And I think mm -hmm. that you're explaining a really intricate way of walking a tightrope between what to take credit for, what not to take mm -hmm. credit for, and what to give yourself as a baseline for, I don't know, I wouldn't say like, there's no such thing as failure in this, I don't believe. Um, because that's making it a pass or fail scenario. And I think that life mm -hmm. is just too detailed for that to mm -hmm. be applied to it. But I think having that understanding for where guilt and shame lies when walking that line is extremely important. It seems like you're delineating in that. And I feel like we don't talk enough about the mental health professional community, EMTs, police, anybody that's in these types of roles the impact that this service has on them. Um, can you tell me what that's like and how you've traversed it and advocate for others to be able to traverse? It? I think, you know, I was, I had the good fortune of being at a, when I was working at a hospital, they had these grand rounds and uh, where a speaker would come in and they would talk to all the doctors and therapists and whatnot. And one of the guys, he came in and he said, if you are doing the really hard work, the really important work in mental health, you are eventually going to lose someone to suicide. So it, having that early in my 20s as a framework, it didn't make, I thought to myself then, oh, that's never going to happen to me or you know, I don't, I don't, but I can say having that, yeah, but having that knowledge that even the best, it, it doesn't mean that you're not a good, you're not good at your job. What it means is that you're where you most need to be. And working in a group home where 80% of the boys that we worked with were either, either going to get somebody pregnant or go to jail before they were 18. Oh, uh, that's like the army. Yeah. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and knowing that like, okay, if, as to your point, we cannot define success as every one of these kids going to Harvard. We have to define success as every day, did I do the best I could to help make this connection, to move this forward? That, to realize that my job as a therapist is to be like a mirror. You know, mm. so if you look in the mirror when you're brushing your teeth, the mirror doesn't brush your teeth for you. It just helps you to see you got a little toothpaste on your cheek. And now it's up to you what you do with that. But, you know, I don't fix you. I don't change you. I just help you to see the angles that you're too close to, to see. So I don't need to be a genius to do this job. I just have to reflect back what I'm seeing and give you another angle and another support. I love that description because obviously you've seen the masks are very important. They're part of the show. Um, and I like that you said reflection. Because too often we live our lives behind the character that we portray and we mm -hmm. don't have that honesty looking back at us. It was funny. I saw like a very poignant cartoon where somebody was looking what you believe normally would be a person looking down at a book and reading. Mm -hmm. But instead, the book was the head and the face was looking at the book and it was telling you to read yourself. Mm -hmm. And it really spoke volumes. And I think that that's what we're describing here is that you have to be able to read from the outside and you have to have a trusting relationship with someone to tell you what's on your mask. You got a stripe mm -hmm. over here, bud. That one's kind of dirty. This one over here is a laceration, probably came during this battle. 
whatever it is. You created Mm -hmm. this one so you wouldn't get hit again by that one. Like, it becomes a whole tapestry of shit. But, like you said, with someone like yourself to translate as a mirror, you're really giving people an opportunity to have an out, but a safe out. They're not Mm -hmm. ashamed of what they're being told is on their mask. Clinicians, one of the things that, you know, I had a grad school professor who taught us, if you're coming out of sessions and you're just absolutely exhausted, now one time, sometimes that could be an an indicator that you're dealing with someone with what we used to call um, an access to diagnosis or personality disorder, Mm. histrionic, narcissistic. But the other thing is often, are you putting in more than the client is? Are you forgetting what your role is here? And are you, are you letting, are you being, are you helping to be the guide to help this person help themselves? Or are you trying to say, hey, I have my own individual agenda for you. I want you to love yourself and you're not loving yourself right now. And I'm trying to wrestle with you to make you love yourself. Well, okay, well, that's not, that's not the job. The job is to say, what is the client? What are their goals? And now I'm trying to lead them, but, I, but it's ultimately it's their session, it's their time. And so if I'm wiped out, you know, and, and having that consultation, the best advice I got in grad school is when in doubt, consult. If you're afraid to consult, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> that's, see, and that's my theory behind not wanting a camera present. In life, mm-hmm. the moment you mm-hmm. don't want a camera present tells me you want to challenge my memory in a public setting later. And I don't <laughs> like that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, we need to be on a level playing field. If you don't want that there, that means you're probably going to lie about something. Yeah. Stretch it, do whatever it is. We need someone to call us liars. Mm-hmm. The mind is designed to protect us, like you were saying earlier. It doesn't care what it's sending back to protect you as long as it's accomplishing its mission. And it can be manifested in some of the weirdest ways. You might take a picture from the right side for the rest of your life because someone told you you had a chip in the back corner tooth forever, like forever, Mm -hmm. and have like this traumatizing way that you sit in front of the mirror or how you dress, or, you know, the size of your earrings, you know, it's so weird how people manifest this shit. And you can't do anything until someone's looking back at you and going, hey, buddy, that's a pirate earring. You might want to fix that. <laughs> well, and, that and, and you point out that like, everything has a function. All and what we understand is that even people who are in throes of a psychotic break, they are, may not be rational, but they are still generally illogical. So if we can understand that the, the brain's main goal is to protect us from pain. And so even things like depression and suicidality, well, their goal is ultimately to say, hey, I don't want to feel any pain anymore. What would stop that? So whether it's addiction, whether it's whatever, I want to have a feeling of control over my pain. So almost everything that our brain does and creates for us is logical, even when it's not rational, is to protect us from, yeah, it's to protect us from pain. And so this idea of whether, and so even no matter if even things like people will say, well, how could a person, you know, be suicidal if the main goal is pretty well, because there's this thought, if I die, I will not experience any more pain. It seems pretty logical to me. 100%. And, or even things like addiction, or even things like someone might say, well, what about self injury? And people self injury is very misunderstood. It's a way of controlling my pain. I so in a world where so many things are out of my control, I can control this aspect. I can control when the pain comes, when it doesn't. Mm. So everything that you know, we see, I see in my office, if we can help people to understand the functions of their behavior, now we can substitute a different way of getting that same thing done. And that's why, again, the title of my podcast is Not Allowed to Die, because that's my only rule. You can do whatever it takes to get you through this world. You're just not allowed to die because we, can, we can substitute one thing for another until we get to the healthiest possible choice. But if we're dead, we can't, we can't make any more choices. There's no more substitutes. Nope. 
that's it. I, but, I yeah. think that's a beautiful mission. Um, too often, or I, I, up until probably the last decade, the word suicide probably got your channel changed. It mm -hmm. got you shut down from a conversation. People didn't want to discuss it. It was a very, very dark word. Um, and I think we're all liars to like the nth degree. To say that you've never had a suicidal ideation is to say mm -hmm. you didn't go through the ages of 13 and 25. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> did you skip something? Because I'm telling you, that is angst grand central and everything mm -hmm. is the end of the world. And it's, it's already that without adding in a bully, without adding mm -hmm. in some, you know, sexual changes and other reproductive, you know, whatever they are, social constraints on the primal mm -hmm. urges that you have. You get, you know, Caligula's last days at prom and then you got to cap it again. And dude, everything is all effed up. I think every single person on this planet has had that. I think mm -hmm. they haven't. They didn't live long. Or they're not very deep. They're, yeah. <laughs> they're, not, they're not thinking very hard. <laughs> yeah. That, that brainwave is uh, just a blip. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I like that you focus on allowing children to be heard and not invalidated and being validated mm -hmm. in those moments where they're sharing what to an experienced or wise person can look back on and call minuscule child's play, stupid games, nothing big, but to be able to take this lens and remove that personal experience where I've seen worse than you've had and empathize with them from their level and in their world and how deeply and how deeply traumatic those small interactions can feel the way that they can trigger just cyclical thinking like nobody's business, created scenarios. Those are the most important times to intervene because once you become your own script writer and you've got 50 scripts around you instead of one, you're going to tear your brain to pieces. Kind of like uh, those old movies where they would tie a, a cowboy between four horses like, mm -hmm. you might as well come out in the end the same way if you're writing four scripts for yourself because you're trying to defend yourself from a bully, maybe defend yourself from a domestic situation at home, or, you know, your insecurities for whatever you weren't born with that society told you you should have. All these different scenarios, and you get in there, and you get to literally kind of block seasonings from going in the soup, or at least Plenty. extracting them before they get too deep. For so many people, when they've had a negative experience at a certain point, especially between those ages of like eight and 11, they start to feel like that's the true baseline of what my life is always going to be. Holy my, the true baseline of my life is pain. Like that's who I am. That's really what I deserve. And even if their older selves intellectually can say, that's not true. I didn't cause my parents divorce. I didn't cause my cousin to die of cancer, whatever that is. But at the same time, if, that's, if that was a core belief in there, then they take every negative thing that happens after that as evidence. Uh, see, the universe hates me and it wants to kick the crap out of me. And it's going to keep doing that. And when people get to a level of despair is this feeling that this terrifying fear that tomorrow will be just as bad as today. And I have so many people who have, they've come through depression, but they feel like, but it's going to come back someday. And maybe it's always going to come back. And because the it's is, comfortable. Even if they're, they're inviting well, and it's you also. Sometimes, or sometimes it's chemical, or sometimes uh, that's it's true. life. That's just, true. I, you know. I think of that victim chair. It can get very, very mm -hmm. comfortable. It's got cup holders. It reclines. It's a whole world where nobody can judge me any further for anything I'm trying to do because I'm right here. Well, and if, if I've just got, if I'm in a prize fight and somebody's just knocked me to the canvas, it's way, it might make feel like it makes a lot more sense to stay down. And that's what your depression is saying to you. Just stay down, man. Because if you get back up, life's going to hit you again. You know, and so that that idea of it's 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 more comfortable sometimes on the canvas than it is to get back on your feet. But the view is a lot better when you get back on your feet. So now it's this issue of, you know, mental health is about balancing our risk factors and our resiliency factors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at any point in life, when we're getting those those feelings coming back and saying, if I did get depression again, I could survive it again. And this trip around this world, we're not promised happiness. 
We're just promised to have an experience. I, I, a lot of the kids, unfortunately, I work with have, are too young to have seen the movie Gladiator. But I, I loved uh, the, the scene in Gladiator when all the, you know, the combatants, they have to come out and they say, we who are about to die salute you. And I thought to myself when watching it as a kid, like, gosh, maybe if you're a gladiator, wouldn't you just like get eaten by the first tiger or do whatever else? But the reality is we want to stay in that pit as long as we can. And I think the weird thing is it's the, that everybody is in the stands. They're actually secretly jealous of the gladiators. Always they want to be jealous down there. of the gladiator. They, yeah. Because the gladiators got the attention. They got not only the, the attention, that they're just, they are never more alive. And so, oh. you know. So we, like when we were suffering, when we were struggling, yeah, you could curl up and get eaten by the tiger. You could get stabbed by somebody. You know, I'm not promising anybody that life is going to be fun, but I am promising that you will have a story and you can make something happen here. And what kind of story do you want to be? What do you want your experience to be? Yeah, that's, so, you know, that's... Yeah, uh, well, that's why I said, you know, pain is art. I've tried mm -hmm. to visualize in the past, I look back on the different situations that brought on anxiety, depression, and, you know, molded who I was in that moment in time. And, you know, I look back on it now, and I try to decipher it in a different manner. Um, I try to look at the fact that all of that scribbling was only in one area of a painting. And mm -hmm. without it, it might not be the blue of an eye and what is a beautiful face. Right. Mm -hmm. Even though it sucked and I was there forever shaking that pen back and forth, it still has something bigger that it's creating for later. And I've mm -hmm. started to try to look back on life like that, that, you know, I'm just standing in a portion. It's like paint by numbers or something like that. Mm -hmm. And each age is a different section. But having the ability to be mindful enough to step back and look at the picture live time is the most difficult thing. Again, that's why we have someone like yourself. For me, I started using meditation. I do see a therapist mm -hmm. and, and every, I got my own toolbox of uh, humans that keep me between the lines, right? <laughs> but meditation became a cornerstone for me in that it allowed me to see, you know, the character that I played, the characters mm -hmm. that people play, you know, mm -hmm. the illusions of time. And it allowed me to really realize that I was making more of the decisions than I thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that I was, again, writing that script. I was writing it for other people and what they thought of me. Mm -hmm. But once I meditated, I got to see that, you know, and get that baseline to work from where I could look at the picture and myself at the same time. But it's really hard to stay in that viewpoint. You can get sucked in and out all the time. Describe mm -hmm. it as a hole in the wall. If a hole in the wall was where everything was effed up in reality and you were standing in front of it, every time you put your head in it, that's when you're living in that false, in that fake reality that's causing all these disturbances. Problem is, is it's easy to get your head in the hole because it's always got a vacuum. And when mm -hmm. you try to pull your head back out to mindfulness, it's mm -hmm. really working on you the entire time until you get it all the way back out and you can look around again. That's the way that I try to describe getting in and out of those states. Mm -hmm. well, and I think, you know, depression has, its in, it's almost like a feeling of increased gravity. Mm. You know, for, so, for people who are going through depression and, and it kind of like, it, it re really resonates with you were saying with me, that, that vacuum, that pull. And it, it not only is it a gravity, but it, it pulls us inward into only focusing on ourselves. Mm. And so what, what mindfulness and gratitude and things like that can do is they can help us turn that lens around and focus outward. So, so the mindfulness is, first of all, depression is a disorder of perception where our problems are really up to our eyes, but they feel like they're up to the clouds. And so mindfulness and meditation can help us to see the world more accurately. And so that can sometimes be the first step in being able to take, make changes in our world and again, focus outward, focus on the things in my life. 98% of your life is probably going okay. But that 2%, if you've stepped on a nail, even if everything else in your life is amazing, it's gonna be hard to focus on anything but that, that pain. And so, yeah, like I, I think, and you know, I love meditation. I think yoga is great. I think martial arts are great. I think the key is people finding what works for them. Therapy is not for everyone. 
And that's, you know, as we talked about, you know, Patrick Romer. Yeah, you does, say that in your he, show a lot. And I, I love that you say that because therapy is some is really beauty is an eye of the beholder kind of thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is the way I look at it. it what works for me is not going to work for you 99.9% of the time. Can't change classes with somebody. If I mm-hmm. hand you my classes, you're not going to see mm-hmm. the same as I see. And all mm-hmm. of those layers are experiences. And each one has its own prescription. Can't swap them. Same thing with your ability to receive therapy or find your outlet that is good mm-hmm. for your mental health. You might need a 0.25 and a 0.20. And I've got those glasses that you can see people from a map waving back at you because mm-hmm. it needs, you know, the extra things, right? But I, I, I love this. Well, and, that's, and so I think I just want everybody who's listening to this to think, you know, just because it worked for somebody else and this isn't working for me, sometimes it's not the right fit. Sometimes it's just not the right therapist. Sometimes it's not the right meditation app. Sometimes it's not the right whichever. But also it's okay if dance is your thing, if gardening is your thing. It's just a matter of figuring out what is it that's going to connect me to the best version of myself to help me to feel like I, I'm only on this planet for so long. Let's try to enjoy it a little bit. That's and authenticity, so again, man. Yeah. I mm-hmm. love that you're bringing this up because I think the, the path to happiness is just being you and accepting mm-hmm. yourself unconditionally, once mm-hmm. you do that, all of your love, creativity, art, whatever it is, I don't care if you're a fucking actuary or you're a painter or whatever it is, you're going to be inclined to do one thing that impacts those around you and it's going to be for the greater good once you find it. It could be music, but whatever it is, making people laugh or it could be documentaries. But mm-hmm. To not be yourself on this trip on the rock is to slap whomever or whatever made you in the face and say you're smarter, right? Or you can do it better. Just horse shit. And really, the moment that you accept yourself is the moment that the pain subsides because you're not going to derive any of it from other people. talk about like the power of animals and particularly you know is is so incredible because they don't give a crap about how you look where you shop anything like that we don't deserve those them ma- no they're so great they're the the love that they give us you know i just dogs cats whichever whatever you connects with for you it can be a snake they don't care about any of the social artifice that we come up with nope when we come to them they can, and, and so for so often, for so many people, accepting love is so challenging mm. because they say, you know, especially from other people, they're like, why would this other person love me? And they push what people away. What do they away. want back? What do what's, they want back? Yeah, what's or, their motive? Mm-hmm. There's yeah, something What's the here. game here? But when they have that love from their dog, when they have that love from their they cat, should. they find it a little easier to accept that love and to say, this creature needs me. And so many people I've talked about how they were all set. They had a plan to die by suicide. And yet they were like, but I can't leave my dog. I can't leave my cat. And sometimes all we need is that like an eight second speed bump when we're on mm. that path to just divert us. And then another idea and solution may we present itself. We are ADHD inherently. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't understand why anybody is even diagnosing this shit anymore. Like it doesn't need to be in the manual because it's just existence. Everybody's mm-hmm. got it. We if you've ever looked at the internet or social media mm-hmm. for more than five minutes, you have ADHD. You're scrolling mm-hmm. through pain, happiness, comedy, pain, happiness, comedy on a slot machine. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's just who we are now. You, mm-hmm. um, and I'm not saying that ADHD isn't something because it really is. I have it. 
Um, and mm -hmm. I know you do as well because you discuss it mm -hmm. openly during your podcast. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not trying to go off on a tangent here, but I like to find out because ADHD is so prominent and mm -hmm. you're working with ESAs or emotional support animals. Mm -hmm. In the ADHD world, what have you found that these animals can do for these people? Well, for so many people with ADHD, they really resist structure. They resist, you know, any kind of like, you can't tell me how to run my life and do things. And I, I, it. I, remember grow, I remember growing up, people trying to make me use an assignment notebook, things like that. And it, it could never work for me. I had to find my own way. But when you have a pet, when you have an animal, that animal needs to be fed. It needs to be cared for. It needs to be walked. And it can allow people to create a structure that they don't resent because they're like, I'm doing this out of love. I'm making this connection because it's working for something that I care about. And so, and even taking little breaks to help recharge. So for a lot of people with ADHD, you know, if I have to sit and study for the bar exam or do something else like that, but I can take a break and go scratch my cat or do something else like that, it can help me give these little mental breaks that can help recharge me so that I can, you know, have that energy for doing these things that are a little bit more unpleasant. I like that uh, you brought that up because I feel like animals are the, you know, they're ultimately mindful. We're the ones mm -hmm. with the human condition. I feel like the, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we're the ones that are the issue on the planet and they're all just mm -hmm. watching us. Um, mm -hmm. And dogs capitalized on our mental illness and said, look, if I lay here and let them get their dopamine from me with scratches, and vice versa, mm -hmm. they'll drop food for me and we can hang out. And they're the, but ipso facto, they're the smartest creatures on the planet, um, in my mind, because they're the ones that capitalized on our mental illness. But you're right. I feel like it also forces mindfulness. When you are engaging with an animal and you're scratching it, petting it, you're not in another place in your mind. You're not in a fake world where you're believing something in the future is going to happen or something that used to happen, you're ultimately in the now. I tell this stupid anecdote all the time from uh, an elderly gentleman in the uh, barbershop told me, you know, his way of putting it was like, if you put your wife and your dog in the trunk of your car and you come back an hour later, which one would be happy to see you? And, you know, ha, ha, ha the dog, yeah, right? Yeah. But it really does resonate with me in that the dog is fine. The dog mm -hmm. will walk away from it, wag its tail, where we go and chuck, let's do our day. The person is permanently scarred by mm -hmm. something that will never exist again. They could write a book, My Time in the Trunk. They could stay away from all cutlasses. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. they could have the weirdest things that have happened to them after that. I am the person that was this once. And I feel like animals have, don't have that sickness. Yeah. And they, just being in their presence brings us away from that mental illness, at least for that time. The, their dogs don't do what if. No. You know, they, and that's, Unless and, the and, hand and, is and then, swinging. Right. And only then. It's, and, and so it's, they live in that moment and that ability to be mindful. Yes, we can graft onto that and to think more like a dog does, to let ourselves, we are going to be our healthiest self when we can be more in that space and in that moment. Anxiety can be a superpower because mm. it can help us to see all the dangers and all the future you know, situations. That being said, it's really exhausting and really inefficient. It really is. And so the more that we can dial our anxiety down and say, okay, my brain, my human brain has the power to look at all these eventualities. But now we have to say, how realistic is that? And is thinking about that could be useful. Never. And instead, <laughs> Almost never, 99% of the time, <laughs> not. It's not here. So instead, can we just be, can we sit and be with our animal? Can we enjoy that time? Can we enjoy that connection? And it's unfortunate, you know, people ask a lot about emotional support animals and say, well, is this even really a necessary thing? And right now on, online, it's a thing that gets mocked and whatnot. All an emotional support animal is, is and it, it's basically a statement that having this animal in your home might reduce the symptoms of your depression, anxiety, whatever you have. But there are a lot, because there are a lot of people who, like their landlords, will charge them extra fees or say you can't have animals here. And I feel for the landlords. Who wants cat piss all over their apartment? It's harder to rent it out afterwards. But the same thing, I mean, the point is, a lot, this is blocking people from the cheapest, most efficient mental health treatment we can possibly give them. The other day, I was talking to a woman who was homeless. And she, she wanted to move into her grandmother's place. And her, her grandmother wanted her to move in. 
but she couldn't move in until I, with Foster Patrick, worked with her to write her an emotional support animal letter. And she was staying homeless rather than be away from her dog. I, I got to say that I probably would if somebody tried to take my dog and told mm-hmm. me I couldn't live in my home with him, uh, with her. I would, I would 100% stand outside of my home until she was allowed to live with me. I wouldn't be able to leave her outside while I sat inside. And that's, it's so fundamental to making people healthier to have this connection. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't be, you know, have to have a general deposit on their apartment or whatnot, so that if they do damage to it, but the vast majority of people who are pet owners love their pets and do a great job of taking care of them. So that's really all an emotional support animal letter is stating is that this person has the right to live with their animal. And I like to think about it like music. If you know, if you are a person who's blasting your music at 3am, then that's you're, you're going to have problems with, you know, and if you are leaving dog crap everywhere, you're going to have problems. But let's not assume everyone who likes music is going to do that. Just know you need three seats on the plane if you have an emotional support peacock. Like, (laughs) don't fucking put yourself in the middle seat with two other people if you happen to be identifying with your emotional support peacock. I'm okay with it. I have no problem with have all the animals, whatever you find that you bond with? Because, I I mean, ultimately, we all come from something. We have Mm -hmm. to be interrelated in some way, shape, or form. That's why we identify with certain animals. They resonate Mm -hmm. with us more. Maybe our genealogically, we come from a different area that had Mm -hmm. this type of bond with this type of animal, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you have. Just uh, there is a certain amount of, you do have to be cognizant that you're bringing a 400-pound pig into the airport, you know, or whatever it is. Don't get mad Mm -hmm. at people. You know, as well, I feel like one of the problems with humans is mm-hmm. we prepare for fights in advance, <laughs> and that energy becomes something that's confrontational before somebody ever even opens their mouth. It's a real thing. You could be smiling on your way up there, but if you've been prepping mentally to argue with someone about this situation, mm-hmm. 99% of the time, they're already affronted. They're already Mm going to tell you, they're already going to have a problem with the situation. So just know, use your animal for what it's for before you have that conversation with somebody. (laughs) So I'm just, that's an extra word of caution. You might have less interaction if you're willing to discuss it a little bit, say what this is, why it helps. I feel like dialogue and communication is how we diffuse this situation with, you know, people carrying it. Now, if you're just carrying an animal around because, you know, you're trendy or you want to be quirky, that's a little different. But well, and and unfortunately, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of people who are abusing the system and they don't have any mental health diagnosis, but they know that they're going to get less pushback from people if they claim they go on Amazon, they buy a vest, they do things like that. And they're, you know, so and so I'm going to get a stethoscope and go over to (laughs) ORMC here and just start walking around. (laughs) <laughs> right. And so there, but there, there are people who do these things, but we shouldn't let those few bad apples poison the feeling about yeah. the therapeutic benefit of animals and what they can do for people. And so you're right. And there, and unfortunately, it is often the people who are breaking the rules, doing things that they shouldn't be doing, which they don't have any entitlement to do. Like, again, like just like that same person who is blasting their music as they're driving through the neighborhood at three in the morning, waking people up. It's, you know, everyone has the right to music, but you don't have the right to make other people's life worse. So if you have an emotional support animal or a a service dog or a therapy dog, the key is you being respectful of the people around you. And the goal is that it's there to help you without infringing on the rights of other people. That kind of awareness seems to be lacking in society today. The impact that we have on others. Um, Mm -hmm. If we were more cognizant about the ripples from the rocks that we drop in the pond, we'd be a lot less apt to be out there just unloading our pockets all the time. Mm Because we're really just annihilating in massive waves the ability to love each other. Mm -hmm. You know, on a grand scale, when we do these things, we have these interactions, we don't realize that somebody's standing behind me that heard that, that maybe wanted an animal, that maybe thought Mm -hmm. about it, you know, and now they're not going to do it. You know, just be cognizant of the surroundings that you're in when you're having these discussions, because it is impactful. We really do. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, and and to your point about people being, I I think too many people, because of that that mindset you've talked about before about people fearing a fight or (sighs) people fearing liability, 
there are so many therapists now, and this is one of the big things we're trying to help therapists change at Positive Patrick is that they worry about liability for writing emotional support animal letters. So when, when a person comes to Positive Patrick, if they go to our website, they can get they can connect it with a wish grantor who will help them if they just need an emotional support animal letter, they'll connect them to a, a therapist who will write one for them for free. Mm-hmm. Or if they need help acquiring an animal, they'll help them find an animal and we can give up to $500 for them to help acquire an animal and up to $750 for training. But many, many of these people who I end up talking to, they have a therapist and they said, yes, my therapist just won't write the letter for me. And I'll say, oh my gosh, why not? Well, they're worried somehow about liability. And the reality is they cannot, if you're a therapist listening to this, you cannot be found liable. All you are <laughs> stating when you write an emotional support animal letter is the person has a disorder. Did? Yeah, well, I mean, it's like all you're saying is that they have a disorder and that they may benefit from having an animal. You are, if that animal, if that peacock goes on the plane and pecks someone's eyes out, I am not liable for that. You know, like that's, that's not the thing, you know? So I, like, there's I, no I reason love not the absurdity, to. Though. I, like, I yeah. like to pick things like that because it's just funny to me. Um, yeah. I, that's another thing. Uh, before we go further, you love humor and mm-hmm. you talk about it throughout your show. Can you tell me how you utilize that in your own you know, mental health and with your, uh, your patients, what kind of, where does that fall in that pyramid? Well, it's funny when I, that, that youth group that saved my life when I was, you know, in middle school, my mother almost made me quit because one of their rules was you weren't allowed to be sarcastic. And she said, I don't know if I want my son in any club where he can't be sarcastic. <laughs> what, what, what is, what comes out of a situation like that? That's weird. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, the, the root words of sarcasm are, it means to tear flesh. And um, the idea of like sarcasm can be like, sarcasm, for me, I didn't even think about yeah, that. Yeah. Well, it's so sarcasm can be used to destroy and just be mean to people, but it can also be, you know, but it can be just like this idea of to be silly and inappropriate and irreverent in a time that seems serious. And so in my therapeutic practice, that's what, like when people are talking about, dying by suicide of things like that. We have to be able to find a way to laugh. We have to be able to joke. I, laugh I have to be able to tease people. every session. I, sometimes I have tears in my eyes. I'm laughing so hard at what's going on in my life and mm-hmm. how we interact. He's amazing. Uh, like I couldn't recommend him to, to more people because he's like you explained, he just sits there and allows me to, you know, tell him what's going on. But regurgitates the obvious back to me, things that I wouldn't see, and then lets mm-hmm. me talk through it right back to him. It's pretty, it's pretty beautiful. Well, and if anybody, if, if had, I don't know if you saw the, the Netflix documentary Stuts that Jonah Hill put out, but if, oh, it's about him and his therapist. And it's incredible. And his, and his therapist is just giving him shit and busting his balls all the time, you know, and like in their interaction. And it's, it's a need. beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it gives a window. Now, not every, a lot of therapists don't feel comfortable with that. A lot of therapists don't feel comfortable putting their own personality into the work because they feel like, okay, this is, this is the, the space for the client. But that's, I just can't work that way. And again, I wouldn't be a fit for someone. That's like, so when a person works with me, they're getting, I don't even who, see how that would no be switch. effective because to be inauthentic means that you're not giving 100% of yourself in the scenario. I think that if you've taken the time to master the skills and, dedicate yourself to the profession, you owe it to that person to show up with your full game, your full character, your full self in order to give them 100% what they deserve in that moment. Yeah, it just, it, I understand the, the challenge is when you, and I experienced this early on in my career, remember I had a student who, he quit smoking and I was so happy for him for him quitting smoking, but then he started avoiding me. And he ended up avoiding me because he knew I was happy for him that he quit smoking. And then when he started smoking again, <laughs> so, so sometimes when we invest ourselves as therapists and whatnot, and the person knows we love and care about them, you know, like, and that's why we have to work through these terms like transference and countertransference, the way that our, mm-hmm. our feelings about each other. But, and that's, but the, the therapy office is a laboratory where we can work on relationships and we can share things that are hard and we can hopefully in a perfect world, we can work through those difficulties of when the person's thinking, oh, my therapist is going to be disappointed in me. Well, let's talk about that because here's a place where we can do that. Whereas with your romantic partner or with your parents, maybe you couldn't, maybe that wouldn't have been safe to do. Mm. And hopefully this therapy office is a place where it is safe to acknowledge that. So I openly acknowledge that again, I, I love my clients. I really care about, they become incredibly important to me and they give me the greatest gift that a person can give, which is their, their trust. They become vulnerable with me. And so I feel like I can't, I can't, to your point, I can't get back anything less than 100% of me. 
And that may eventually mean I burn out and I, I can't keep doing this. But in the time that I'm here, I give it, you know, all that I've got. It'll just be something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the, the moment you burn out from this just means that you've morphed into the next version of yourself. And mm-hmm. however that is, you know, to be authentic in that moment. Mm-hmm. I, that's just simply the way it works. That's, I, I think that we overcomplicate the human experience so much. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And again, I want to thank you for being a lighthouse. I say this at a lot of shows when we're, we're wrapping up, but I firmly believe that it's our duty to not necessarily direct everybody where to go, but to actually be 100% ourselves and allow them to see us as who they can be, right? Setting examples. You lead people to where you are. You don't have to go grab them and pull, you, pull them to you. And when you stand up and you start doing things like you're doing, you know, advocating with animals, you know, and the emotional support animals and working as social work with the children and all these types of things, you're showing people that there is reward in a life of service. Mm -hmm. And I know for myself, when I began podcasting and and starting this journey, same way, um, the more I gave back, the better I felt. It borderline narcissistic after a while, the reward that you feel when you see someone traverse something that you got a chance to show them through examples or, you know, when someone reaches out to you. Um, So I want to thank you for being a lighthouse. I want to thank you for setting up a program um, like Pause for Patrick. I think it's beautiful. I love your podcast. You are like talking Zoloft. Um, <laughs> I felt so calm when I was listening to your show. I was like, this guy can read me the phone book. Like, I love it. So know that your show is very well put together. I recommend it to everybody. It's not just for people that are dealing with suicidal ideations or suicide directly within their life. I think it talks more generally to the mental health experience and how to avoid getting into that lowest state. Um, ahead of time. I think um, I think it's a beautiful thing. Do you want to tell everybody where they can find you? Anything you want to wrap up with, you know, upcoming events, feel free. Well, thank you so much. I mean, uh, yes, you can find my podcast, Not Allowed to Die, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. Um, but more, I would really direct anybody who, if you know somebody who's a young person, young is very loosely defined, 26 and younger, but, you know, anybody who's even a parent of young people, if they have emotional health issues and they could benefit from an emotional support animal, please tell them to check out pauseforpatrick.org. And again, we are there to try to help connect people to animals and just hope that everyone will open up to these different modalities and ways of connecting because if you're struggling and you're suffering, you're not getting extra points for that. So let's go ahead and live the best life that's available for us. Let's put down the masks of expectations as you're always talking about and just allow ourselves to to have as much joy as we can get while we're on this planet. So again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to share that. Beautifully said. I appreciate you so much. And uh, remember, everybody, be cool and keep learning.